The uh, 25th objection to belief in God, found on the website godisimaginary.com, is entitled Understand Evolution and Abiogenesis. And the gist of the argument is it starts by uh, recognizing that there are various Christians who accept some version of uh, biological evolution or of um, uh, uh, even the evolution of the, of the universe as a whole. And, um, and the, the conclusion that is made or the argument that is made is that evolution is by its very nature a theory of reality or a, an approach to reality that denies that there is a soul, that there is a human soul. Uh, and because evolutionary theory seeks to explain everything by purely natural, material, causal interrelationships that are not directed in any sense by God, but rather they are uh, things that work their way out from within the struggle for life and the struggle for survival among biological organisms, uh, consequently, the idea of a soul is uh, is foreign to evolutionary biology. So these Christians who are accepting evolution uh, are actually uh, committing uh, their own sort of uh, theological suicide uh, by cutting out the ground from underneath them. By, by accepting evolution, they're essentially denying the soul. Uh, in response to this, I would say that uh, several things. One is the idea of Christians accepting evolution. Um, you know, from a Catholic standpoint, the Catholic Church uh, has obviously had a very long history of interacting with scientific questions. Uh, when we look at the biblical accounts of, of creation that we find back in the book of Genesis, and then there are other sporadic references through the Bible to God's creation of the world, it's obviously a very important aspect of biblical theology is that the world comes from God, that God is its ultimate source, and that human beings are part of God's original plan in creating the world. Uh, and that all of this is, is certainly uh, uh, ideas that the Bible very much focuses on and that are very, very important for the Bible. At the same time, it's very important to keep in mind that the modern scientific method that is used to try to arrive at a, a scientific understanding of the world is certainly something that is foreign to the ancient authors of Scripture. Uh, the authors of Scripture are writing most likely apologetic texts, that is, texts that, that are intended to defend the... Um, uh, understanding of God and the human person and of history uh, that they wanted to defend in these biblical accounts. Uh, they're certainly not wanting to carry on a debate about biological origins because they didn't have any kind of sophisticated sense of, of biological origins. Uh, there was no particular reason to ask those sorts of questions at the time. And so we shouldn't expect the Bible to answer questions that were irrelevant to most of the centuries that the Bible has been read. So what is our approach to these things? Well, from a Catholic Christian perspective, we believe that all truth comes from God. Uh, everything that is true in some way or another can be integrated together into the context of Christian faith because Christian faith believes that God is the source of all that is true, whether that be scientific truth, whether that be theological truth, whether it be historical truth or otherwise. Everything comes to us uh, as a truth that directs us back to God. What we find in the course of scientific history is that uh, oftentimes we are surprised by the world that God made. In other words, the, the, the world uh, is not the sort of place that we can just deduce from some type of original idea. Like I have an idea of uh, what the world should be like and I just deduce what everything should be like and, uh, and that's all I need to know. No, what we find is that the world is a surprising place. The more we study it, the more we think about it, the more things sort of uh, shock us or, or astonish us as we study it. Uh, for example, uh, the, the notion that, uh, uh, let's say, the world, uh, you know, that the earth is a perfect sphere, for instance. Well, it turns out not to be a perfect sphere. Or the idea that, uh, that the orbits of the planets around the sun uh, should be perfect uh, circular spheres. Uh, people like Galileo argued such a thing. Uh, that turns out to be false, too. Uh, the idea that the world is sitting still, it sure does uh, intuitively seem like it's sitting still, uh, that turns out to be false too. The earth is moving at a very high rate of speed, although it doesn't seem like it's moving at a high rate of speed. Um, the idea of biological evolution, the idea of the Big Bang. There were many scientists, many astronomers who were arguing, and, and cosmologists and physicists who were arguing in the time of Einstein, for example, and before uh, what was called the steady state theory of the universe, that it just always uh, sort of stays an equal uh, amount of energy and that there's no beginning to it and that uh, things continue in their basic uh, processes of, of internal rejuvenation forever. And what we've discovered uh, in uh, the last century or so is that the evidence actually... Uh, 
uh, points in quite a different direction, the direction of a universe that has a beginning, that time and space has a beginning, uh, and that uh, the energy of the universe will eventually be, uh, uh, under the forces of entropy, will eventually be used up in the sense that it will be uh, uh, a cold, dead universe. And that appears to be sort of the direction that the, the science would, would lead us to in respect to these sorts of questions. Uh, Newtonian physics is another great example that uh, uh, Newton's uh, understanding of the of uh, motion in the world uh, was uh, taken to be uh, the final word on the matter. Even Immanuel Kant, a famous, famous uh, Prussian philosopher, uh, uh, assumed that uh, Newtonian physics was the final word on the nature of the material world and its motions. Well, that turned out to be false in the uh, 20th century, especially uh, with the discovery of. Uh, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum physics, uh, these things uh, fundamentally shook the foundations of Newtonian uh, physics. Uh, and so we discovered that the world was even more astonishing and different than we thought that it was. My point here is, the point that I'm trying to get at, is that the world is a series of unexpected, unusual uh, types of events. And this should tell us, for those of us who believe in God, it should warn us of... Uh, of, of uh, of jumping too quickly to conclusions based on deducing from our understanding of God or the nature of the world around us what the world has to be like. I see frequently in these atheist writings, they'll say things like, you know, well, if God exists, then this should be the case, but it's not, therefore God doesn't exist. And my response to that is simply, uh, who are you to say what the world must be like? Uh, the world is a surprising place. It's, a, it's an enchanting place. It's an unusual place. Uh, and, um, and so uh, that tells us something about its creator, that the creator of the world is, uh, is infinitely diverse, is infinitely creative. And so as I walk around this world and I open my eyes and I look at anything from a blade of grass to a piece of dust uh, to the grandest of mountains and the greatest of, uh, of uh, stars, all of this reflects the creativity of the creator and the origin of the world. Now on to the issue of, of evolution. Um, I would say that, uh, or I would make the case that evolutionary biology focuses on specific sorts of causal relationships that have yielded the diversity of biological species that we see in the world. Uh, I would argue that the biological theories of, of science are not fully explanatory of all levels of causality, that there's more going on than what, uh, than what biology focuses on. For example, we have the fundamental impulse to life and to survival and to more and more higher and higher levels of complexity that we see at work in the world, that there seems to be an internal dynamic force within living beings that is pushing them to, to greater and greater levels of being, of, uh, of perfection. And that force, that internal dynamism in the world around us, is something that finds higher and higher levels of expression, ultimately giving rise to creatures like ourselves who can open our eyes, look at the world, and ask why, and what is its origin, and what is its cause. What I would suggest to you is taking the best of biblical theology. In the scriptures, what is emphasized is, first of all, that God is free, that God is the source of this world, the cause of this world, the reason why there is a world, and that God did ha not have to make the world. There was no necessity in God making the world. There was nothing that forced God to make the world. It was a free act of God. God is perfect in himself. There's no need for a world. It is the sheer generosity of God, the, the sheer diffusiveness or the willingness of God to spread his, his infinite eternal reality into other beings that he creates. That's the only reason why there is a creation at all. And so God freely creates the world as an act of generosity and love. He makes the world and he instills within that world. Imagine that world coming into being. Time and space come to exist. Matter itself comes to exist. And God instills within that world a dynamic principle of, of let's call it soul or life. And that life uh, force or that life power, that internal dynamism, pushes and, and pushes and pushes the world toward greater and greater levels of complexity, of order, of com combining together different things. And there is at work, underneath the visible, observable activities of the world, there is this immaterial uh, force that is pressing it along. And the goal of that internal dynamism is that the world will eventually become as much like its cause as possible, that the world will become as similar 
to its origin as possible. And that is precisely what we see in the human person, is finally, after presumably billions of years of evolution, of development, and of striving within the creation, finally the creation has become aware of itself in the human person. And that awareness within the human person of its origin, of God, uh, of, uh, of the reasons for things, even scientific knowledge itself, is an expression of that internal desire of the creation to become aware of itself and to become as much like its origin as possible. The very fact that we're able to have this conversation, the very fact that matter and energy has become conscious of itself is, the, is evidence, I think, of another principle instilled within nature, uh, another principle that is concurrently or concomitantly uh, 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 cooperating and acting alongside of the development of matter or the material world. I would suggest to you that you think about your own being. Often in the history of Christian theology, the human person has been seen as a kind of microcosm of the, of the whole of the creation. That you and I, within ourselves, have both the material world as well as the spiritual world, the immaterial world present within us. The evidence of that is the thoughts that you're having right now. The thoughts that you are having are evidence of an internal dimension to the world. It's not just the outside, ob objective, sort of material, measurable, asp measurable aspects of reality that are real. There is the internal, the spiritual, the immaterial thought. Uh, all of that is freedom. All of this is part of reality, an essential internal dynamic aspect of reality. That's why I think atheists, that's one of the reasons I think it's so important to respond to atheist objections to Christianity and to belief in God. I think it's so important because uh, it, it allows us to highlight things like this that, the, that I think show something very impoverished and weak about the atheist view of things. The atheist touts science, but science devoid of spirit and of, of life and of hope and of, of the ultimate origins, the ultimate questions and answers that we seek as human beings. Uh, the atheist uh, abstracts away from those things, denies those things even. And by denying that there is that interior and that spiritual dimension to reality, they end up with a very surfaced and cold and um, an empty uh, perspective on reality. And that to me is what is so sad about atheism, is uh, one of the things that's so sad about it, is that it leaves you at the end of the day. If atheism wins, which I, I don't think for one moment that it will, it's too empty, it's too devoid of life. Uh, it has moments that it flares up in history, usually as a protest movement to something that it finds problematic or, or whatever. Uh, but atheism, I think, in the long run will not uh, survive precisely because it doesn't satisfy or truly answer the deep longings of the human spirit because it denies the human spirit altogether. And that's what happens in this particular article here is it denies the reality of human spirit and it says that it's nothing but the effect of chemical reactions and therefore when we die, we die. There is no spiritual life. And that leads to all kinds of, of difficulties and problems, one of which is, that I'll just throw out in passing, one of them is that even the thought processes that the atheist has are nothing but the effects of chemical reactions. And when you die, those thought processes cease. Uh, how can you know there's any objectivity to those uh, conclusions that the atheist draws? You know, one of the fascinating things about atheism is that it's a claim about all reality. Uh, it's a claim that there is no God, that there is no ultimate overarching personal mind that is the source of the world and that everything is nothing but matter, that there's no reason at all to believe that there's anything more than matter and therefore only science, like in these kinds of atheists, only science is the pathway to knowing anything that is true. The atheist, by saying these things, is trying to make a claim about all of reality, about all of what exists. They're making a kind of metaphysical claim, at least in the sense that they're claiming to know what all of reality is. That's a very, very big claim that to be ultimately grounded only in chemical reactions and to be able to say based on those chemical reactions that the effect of them is a theory, a true theory about what all of reality is, I think is saying an awful lot. And I think it goes beyond what the resources of atheism allow you to say. So, in short and in conclusion, I would say that evolution, uh, is, uh, from a biological standpoint, is only an incomplete or partial explanation of things. And I think that uh, Christian theology and belief in God uh, addresses that deeper interior dimension that, uh, that science and that biology leave untouched.